Andrei Chikatilo was born in the village of Yabloknoi, Yabluchny, in the Ukrainian SSR's modern Sumy Oblast. He was born not long after the famine in Ukraine that Joseph Stalin caused by forcing farmers to work together. Ukrainian farmers were forced to give up all of their crops so that they could be shared across the country. There was widespread starvation in Ukraine, and reports of people eating each other rose. Anna Chikatilo's mother, told him that his older brother Stepan had been kidnapped and eaten by neighbors who were hungry, but no one has ever been able to confirm this on their own. Both of Chikatilo's parents worked on farms and lived in huts with just one room. Chikatilo slept on a single bed with his parents when he was a child. He wet the bed all the time, and each time his mother yelled at him and hit him. When the Soviet Union entered World War II, his father, Roman, was forced to join the Red Army. After getting hurt in battle, he was taken prisoner. Chikatilo saw some of the effects of the Blitzkrieg during the war, which both scared and interested him. Chikatilo and his mother were once forced to watch as their hut burned down. Chikatilo's mother had a girl in 1943, while Chikatilo's father was fighting at the front. In 1949, Chikatilo's father went back home. He had been freed by the Americans. Instead of being honored for his service in the war, he was called a traitor because he gave up to the Germans. As a child, Chikatilo was shy and worked hard. He was also a big fan of communist literature. Fears also picked on him and made him feel bad. During his teenage years, he found out that he had chronic impotence, which made his social awkwardness and dislike of himself even worse. Chikatilo was shy around women. When he was 17, he jumped on an 11-year-old friend of his younger sister and wrestled her to the ground while he ejaculated. This was the only sexual experience he had as a teenager. Chikatilo finished school in 1953 and tried to get a scholarship at Moscow State University. He passed the entrance exam, but his grades weren't high enough for him to be accepted. Chikatilo served his required time in the military from 1957 to 1960. Chikatilo got married to a woman he met through his younger sister in 1963. They had a son and a daughter together. Chikatilo later said that he and his wife didn't have much sex and that, after she found out he couldn't keep an erection, they agreed that, so she could get pregnant, he would ejaculate outside of her and push his sperm into her vagina with his fingers. In 1965, they had a daughter named Ludmila. In 1969, they had a son named Yuri. In 1971, Chikatilo finished a correspondence course in Russian literature and graduated from Rostov University with a degree in the subject. Svetlana Gorenkova was waiting for a streetcar to take her home late in the afternoon of December 22, 1978, in the small coal mining town of Shakta in southern Russia. As she waited in the cold, she noticed a young girl with a lot of weight standing close by. The girl couldn't have been older than 10, and she was wearing a red coat with a black fur-trimmed hood. She wore a brown rabbit fur hat and a woolen scarf as extra protection from the cold. Svetlana wasn't so much interested in the girl or her clothes as she was in the man she was with. He was a tall man in his forties with gray hair who wore a long black coat and carried a shopping bag. The man had a long face and a long nose, and his glasses were too big for his face. She was suspicious of him not because of how he looked, but because of how he looked at the young girl and spoke to her in a whisper. Even though it looked like the girl didn't know him, she seemed interested in what he had to say. After some time, the man left. Soon after, the girl came along, looking happy and content. Svetlana watched them leave but then her streetcar came and she could no longer see them. Lena Zakotnova was a bright, happy nine-year-old girl who was walking home from school when she met the man at the trolley stop. She had told a school friend earlier that a nice old man she'd met might give her some imported chewing gum. Maybe that's why she went with the man to his secret house, which was a small, run-down shack not far from the trolley stop. When they got close to their destination, the man unlocked the shack's door, turned on the light, and led the girl inside. He then locked the door behind them. As soon as he got inside, he pushed her to the floor and took her coat and pants off. When she started to scream, he put his arm across her throat and put his weight on her until she stopped moving. He tried to have sex with her while her eyes were still open, so he used her scarf to cover her eyes. When he couldn't get an erection, he started to touch the girl's genitalia with his fingers. This made him orgasm like never before. As he kept beating her, she started moving around under him and trying to breathe through her hurt throat. He pulled out a knife and stabbed the girl three times in the stomach because he was afraid she would tell on him. When she was still, he picked up her body and things. 
walked across an empty lot, and went to the Grushevka River. In his hurry to get out, he missed two things. The victim's blood was on the front step and on the light that he had left on. When he got to the river, he threw her body into the cold water and watched it float away. He turned around and went home, throwing her school bag after her. He didn't know that the girl was still alive. The next day, when Lena's body was found floating in the river, Fetlana Gurenkova told police at the scene that she had seen the girl at the tram stop with a tall, thin, middle-aged man in glasses and a black overcoat. A sketch of the man was made by a police artist who was called in. Later that night the Shakti police arrested Alexander Kravchenko, a local man who had already served six years of a 10-year sentence for raping and killing a 17-year-old girl in 1970. Kravchenko was 25 years old when he was arrested, and he had never worn glasses. While Kravchenko was being questioned, Gurenkova's description of the suspect was used to make a sketch that was passed around the town. One man who saw it was the head of a mining school in the area. After taking a close look at the drawing, he told the police that it looked a lot like Andrei Chikatilo, one of his teachers. The police told him not to tell anyone that he had identified the person. Later, two more detectives were looking for clues in the streets near the river when they saw blood on the steps of a small shack. Andrei Chikatilo was born in the village of Yabloknoi, Yablukne, in the Ukrainian SSR's modern Sumy Oblast. He was born not long after the famine in Ukraine that Joseph Stalin caused by forcing farmers to work together. Ukrainian farmers were forced to give up all of their crops so that they could be shared across the country. There was widespread starvation in Ukraine, and reports of people eating each other rose. Anna, Chikatilo's mother, told him that his older brother Stepan had been kidnapped and eaten by neighbors who were hungry, but no one has ever been able to confirm this on their own. Both of Chikatilo's parents worked on farms and lived in huts with just one room. Chikatilo slept on a single bed with his parents when he was a child. He wet the bed all the time, and each time his mother yelled at him and hit him. When the Soviet Union entered World War II, his father, Roman, was forced to join the Red Army. After getting hurt in battle, he was taken prisoner. Chikatilo saw some of the effects of the Blitzkrieg during the war, which both scared and interested him. Chikatilo and his mother were once forced to watch as their hut burned down. Chikatilo's mother had a girl in 1943, while Chikatilo's father was fighting at the front. In 1949, Chikatilo's father went back home, he had been freed by the Americans. Instead of being honored for his service in the war, he was called a traitor because he gave up to the Germans. As a child, Chikatilo was shy and worked hard. He was also a big fan of communist literature. Peers also picked on him and made him feel bad. During his teenage years, he found out that he had chronic impotence, which made his social awkwardness and dislike of himself even worse. Chikatilo was shy around women. When he was 17, he jumped on an 11-year-old friend of his younger sister and wrestled her to the ground while he ejaculated. This was the only sexual experience he had as a teenager. Chikatilo finished school in 1953 and tried to get a scholarship at Moscow State University. He passed the entrance exam, but his grades weren't high enough for him to be accepted. Chikatilo served his required time in the military from 1957 to 1960. Chikatilo got married to a woman he met through his younger sister in 1963. They had a son and a daughter together. Chikatilo later said that he and his wife didn't have much sex and that, after she found out he couldn't keep an erection, they agreed that, so she could get pregnant, he would ejaculate outside of her and push his sperm into her vagina with his fingers. In 1965, they had a daughter named Ludmila. In 1969, they had a son named Yuri. In 1971, Chikatilo finished a correspondence course in Russian literature and graduated from Rostov University with a degree in the subject. Svetlana Gorenkova was waiting for a streetcar to take her home late in the afternoon of December 22, 1978, in the small coal mining town of Shakta in southern Russia. As she waited in the cold, she noticed a young girl with a lot of weight standing close by. The girl couldn't have been older than 10, and she was wearing a red coat with a black fur-trimmed hood. She wore a brown rabbit fur hat and a woolen scarf as extra protection from the cold. Svetlana wasn't so much interested in the girl or her clothes as she was in the man she was with. He was a tall man in his forties with gray hair who wore a long black coat and carried a shopping bag. The man had a long face and a long nose, and his glasses were too big for his face. She was suspicious of him not because of how he looked, but because of how he looked at the young girl and spoke to her in a whisper. Even though it looked like the girl didn't know him, she seemed interested in what he had to say, after some time, the man left. Soon after, the girl came along, looking happy and content. 
Svetlana watched them leave but then her streetcar came and she could no longer see them. Lena Zakotnova was a bright, happy nine-year-old girl who was walking home from school when she met the man at the trolley stop. She had told a school friend earlier that a nice old man she'd met might give her some imported chewing gum. Maybe that's why she went with the man to his secret house, which was a small, run-down shack not far from the trolley stop. When they got close to their destination, the man unlocked the shack's door, turned on the light, and led the girl inside. He then locked the door behind them. As soon as he got inside, he pushed her to the floor and took her coat and pants off. When she started to scream, he put his arm across her throat and put his weight on her until she stopped moving. He tried to have sex with her while her eyes were still open, so he used her scarf to cover her eyes. When he couldn't get an erection, he started to touch the girl's genitalia with his fingers. This made him orgasm like never before. As he kept beating her, she started moving around under him and trying to breathe through her hurt throat. He pulled out a knife and stabbed the girl three times in the stomach because he was afraid she would tell on him. When she was still, he picked up her body and things, walked across an empty lot, and went to the Grush of the River. In his hurry to get out, he missed two things. The victim's blood was on the front step and on the light that he had left on. When he got to the river, he threw her body into the cold water and watched it float away. He turned around and went home, throwing her school bag after her. He didn't know that the girl was still alive. The next day when Lena's body was found floating in the river, Svetlana Gorenkova told police at the scene that she had seen the girl at the tram stop with a tall, thin, middle-aged man in glasses and a black overcoat. A sketch of the man was made by a police artist who was called in. Later that night, the Shakti police arrested Alexander Kravchenko, a local man who had already served six years of a 10-year sentence for raping and killing a 17-year-old girl in 1970. Kravchenko was 25 years old when he was arrested, and he had never worn glasses. While Kravchenko was being questioned, Gorenkova's description of the suspect was used to make a sketch that was passed around the town. One man who saw it was the head of a mining school in the area. After taking a close look at the drawing, he told the police that it looked a lot like Andrei Chikatilo, one of his teachers. The police told him not to tell anyone that he had identified the person. Later, two more detectives were looking for clues in the streets near the river when they saw blood on the steps of a small shack. Most of the first body found was made up of bones. The remains were found by a man who was looking for firewood in the Lesopolosa, which is a rectangular shelter belt of trees planted to protect the land from erosion. Even though the area was only about 50 yards wide and had a path going through it, no one saw the body until it was pretty much gone. Some of the bones had small patches of leathery skin, and the skull had some black hair hanging off of it. The person who found the bones told the militia, which is the local government in this southern part of Russia. The body was on its back with its head turned to the side and had no clothes on. The victim's ears were still mostly there, and you could see small holes for earrings. This, along with the length of her hair, suggested that she was a woman. From how she was lying when she died, it also looked like she had tried to fight off her attacker. It looked like two ribs had been broken, maybe with a knife, and closer inspection showed that the bone had been stabbed many times. Also, the eye sockets looked like they had been cut with a knife, as if the eyes were being taken out. Similar cuts were seen in the pelvic area. The police thought that whoever did this was a crazy animal. A 13-year-old girl named Lubov Buryuk from the nearby village of Novacherkask was reported missing. Investigators called the girl's uncle, who had looked for her for a long time after she went missing earlier in the month. He went to where the body was lying to look at what was left of it. Lubov's uncle, who may have been holding on to a small bit of hope, said that his niece's hair wasn't as dark and that the bones looked like they'd been there longer than she had been missing. A few hours later, Major Mikhail Fatisov came from the military headquarters in the closest big city, Rostovodon. He was the best sishchik, or detective, in the whole area. He asked if there were any other missing people in the area and told military trainees to search the woods nearby. He also said that fingerprints should be taken from the remaining skin on the hands. The next day, people looking for the girl found a white sandal and a yellow bag with the brand of cigarettes she was trying to buy. Then, fingerprints on the body and the covers of the schoolgirl's books proved that this was Lubov's body. A DNA test to identify the body would take a few years, but from what they already knew, they were sure it was the missing girl. The medical examiner thought that the fast rate of decomposition was due to warm weather and a lot of rain. Even though the area around her body was thoroughly searched, no clues were found that could help find out who killed her, and Lubov's dress was missing. That meant that there was no way to find out anything about it. 
people thought it was a random attack that would be hard to solve. Robert Cullen, who wrote a well-known book about the case, said that most murders in that part of Russia fell into one of two categories, intimate killings, in which a person got angry or drunk and killed someone he knew, usually a family member, and instrumental killings, in which the victim was killed so that the killer could take something from him. But no one in the girl's family seemed like a clear suspect, and she hadn't been carrying anything of value. A body was found near a path that people often took, and a road was only 75 yards away. This had been a dangerous crime with signs of going too far. Sexual crimes were thought to be a sign of how self-centered Western societies were, but there were many clues that this was just such a killing. The autopsy report showed later that she had been attacked from behind and hit hard in the head with both the handle and the blade of a knife. She might have passed out right away. In any case, she had been stabbed at least 22 times and had other parts cut off. In Richard Lowry's book Hunting the Devil, which is told partly from the killer's point of view, there were 41 wounds. The police came up with ideas and started looking for possible suspects, such as people who were mentally ill, young criminals, or people who had committed sex crimes in the past. They tried to find out who Lubov knew and how she could have met this murderer. One man who had been convicted of another rape found out that he was a suspect and killed himself right away. The investigation seemed to be over after that. There were no other good suspects, and for all they knew the killer might have found his own way to make up for what he did. Then, though, another victim was found, Less than two months after Lubov's bones were found, a railroad worker walking near the train station for Shakta, a small industrial town 20 miles away, found more bones. It looked like it had been there for about six weeks, and it was easy to figure out that it was an adult woman. The body had been stripped and was lying on its back with its legs wide open. Investigators took notice because there were a lot of stab wounds and broken eye sockets, just like in Lubov's murder. Murder didn't look like that very often. Since no one of this size and gender had been reported missing, there was no way to figure out who it was. A month later, a soldier who was gathering wood a month later found more remains a woman lying face down. She was covered with branches, but a close look showed that she had been cut with a knife and that her eye sockets had been hurt. She, too, was never found. The connection was clear. At least three people have been killed by the same person. But no one was saying that, especially not to the press. Officially, they had three separate murders that had not been solved. Richard Lowry says they actually had seven that year, but they didn't know that for a long time. Major Fatisov put together a team of 10 men to start a full-time, aggressive investigation. He wanted to find out what was going on and stop this crazy person from hurting any more women. Viktor Barakov, a 37-year-old second lieutenant from the criminology lab, was one of the people he recruited. His story is told in Cullen's book. He was the best person they had to look at fingerprints, footprints, and other physical signs at a crime scene. He was also an expert in both police science and martial arts. He was asked to join the Division of Especially Serious Crimes in January 1983 because of how hard he worked. No one knew then how hardworking he would be and how hard he would have to be. In the same month, the body of a fourth person was found. She seemed to have been killed about six months ago and the second set of bones were found near where she was killed. She too had knife wounds, but some clothes that were thought to be hers were found nearby. She might have been in her teens. At this point they only knew that the killer, who was once called the maniac, did not smoke or he would have taken the cigarettes found near Lubov and was a man. Authorities didn't know if he had a problem with his eyes because of a superstition, a fetish, or something else. In any case, as Cullen says, the fact that the eyes were gouged out showed that the killer spent some time with the dead people after they were killed. Since there were no clear leads, the team decided to look back in time to see if there were other victims. Barakov's first real job was to lead an investigation into the disappearance of a 10-year-old girl in Novoshaktansk, a farming and mining town in the area. On December 10, 1982, Olga Stalmashenok went to a piano lesson. Since then, no one has seen her. Barakov talked to her parents and found out that she got along well with them and didn't seem to have any reason to just leave. But the parents got a strange postcard from sadist Black Cat telling them that their daughter was in the woods and that there would be 10 more victims in the next year. Barakov thought it was a sick joke, but he was still afraid the girl was dead. Then on April 14th, four months after Olga had gone missing, her body was found in a field about three miles from where she had gone to take her music lesson. On a shared farm, her naked body was in a frozen tractor rut. 
the police left her there until Barakov could come see for himself what had happened, because she had been killed in the winter, the snow had kept her body in good shape, so it was easy to see the pattern of knife wounds on her bluish-white skin. The skull, chest, and stomach all had holes in them. The knife had been put in dozens of times, as if in a hurry, moving the organs around in the body cavity. The killer had aimed for the heart, lungs, and sexual organs in particular. Like the others this person had used a single-bladed knife to cut the eyes. Barakov knew for sure that he was looking for a vicious, sexually motivated serial killer who attacked victims at a faster and faster rate, didn't draw attention to what he was doing, and didn't leave any evidence. Barakov didn't know of any resources that could be used. Men who were killed in this way were said to be rare, and only high-level officials knew the details of the investigations into them. Barakov thought the killer had a car because he took the long way from the preserve to where the body was left. He was also sure that the man did not scare people when he came close. There was nothing obvious about him that would have scared women or kids away. That would make it harder to find him, even though he probably had some kind of mental illness that he tried to hide. They decided to focus all of their attention on finding out where known sex offenders in the area were on December 11th. Then men who lived or worked near the conservancy and owned or drove a car were let out of the hospital. Also, handwriting experts were brought in to compare the writing on the black cat card to samples from the whole town. It was hard work that didn't look like it would lead to a single clue. But doing nothing was a sure way to get nowhere, so they had at least a start. Lowry says that they didn't know that a 15-year-old boy had been killed in a similar way near Shakta and left for the snow to cover his body. No one would find him for a while. For the next four months, they didn't find anything useful, even though they knew that snow could easily hide what had happened. Then, they found out that the killer had struck again. A group of boys found bones in a gully in another wooded Lesopolosa near Rustabadon. Again, they couldn't find a missing persons report, and an examination of the bones linked this crime to the others and seemed to show that the girl had Down syndrome. That made things a little easier, even though it was horrifying to think that the killer had lured a mentally retarded child who couldn't fight back. They could find out who it was by looking at the special schools in the area. During the winter, a 45-year-old woman was also killed in the woods, but nobody connected her to the Lesopolosa series. That would happen after that. It turned out that the girl was 13 and went to a school for kids with her condition. Since she left often, no one had missed her, so no one had called the police. But her case was put on hold because the next body was found two miles away in a wooded area near Rostov's airport in September. But it was a boy who was only eight years old. Like the others, he had been stabbed, including in the eyes, and it turned out that he had been missing since August 9th. He had taken the bus, just like the little girl who was going to piano lessons. Everyone was confused by this new turn of events. From what little was known about killers, it was thought that they always went after the same kind of victim. This person had killed both adults and young girls and boys. The police were worried that more than one killer might be doing the same weird ritual. It seemed impossible, but so did the idea that a person could be sexually violent towards so many different kinds of people. Then Baraka found out that the killer had been caught at last. It was finished. He went to jail to find out as much as he could about this person. 19-year-old Yuri Klinik was the suspect. He had lived in a home for children with disabilities for many years and then learned how to lay floors in construction. He stayed friends with older boys from his old neighborhood, and one day, the conductor of a trolley caught him and his friends. She grabbed one boy and asked him what he knew about the recent killings. He told her that Yuri was responsible. So, the officials thought they had solved the case based on the squirming accusation of a boy with a slow mind who was trying to get out of punishment. Yuri was caught in question. He didn't have the right to a lawyer or to say anything. He didn't really know what was going on. Still, he lied about everything. No one had been killed by him. Cullen says that the interrogators kept him there for several days because they thought that a guilty man would always confess. Soon, Yuri realized that he had to tell them what they wanted to hear to stop being beaten, so he did. And even more! He admitted to all seven murders and also to four other murders in the area that had not yet been solved. Now, all the police needed was evidence to back up their claims. This young man had a lot going for him. Viktor Barakov agreed to look into the matter further. Yuri seemed like a possible suspect because he had a mental illness and rode the bus. And if he didn't commit those terrible crimes, why would he admit to them? Back then, and even now, people didn't know much about how people make false confessions. People with less intelligence are more likely to give in to suggestions, especially when they're tired, 
and they'll tell interrogators whatever they want to hear. Usually, they give hints based on what they hear in the questions. Sociologist Richard Offsch gives case after case of suspects who admitted to things they didn't do even though the consequences were harsh, and Reitzman gives several studies of people who had confessed to the crime for which they were in prison but were later cleared by DNA evidence. Most juries don't think that people will lie when they confess, so they see confessions as the best proof against someone. Even better, when a suspect can lead police to the place where someone was killed, that's good proof, and Kulnick did that in a few of the cases. Barakov, however, was not convinced. He saw that Kulnick never went straight to a site, even when he was close. Instead, he seemed to wander around until he figured out where the police wanted him to go. Barakov didn't think that was a good way to test. When he looked at the written confession, it made him even less sure. He could see that Kulnick had been told most of what he was supposed to say and had felt scared because of that. It was hard to figure out what to do next, but then another body turned up. In another wooded area, the remains of a young woman who had been cut up were found. Her nipples were cut off, her abdomen was cut open, maybe with teeth, and one eye socket was hurt. She had been there for months, and all of her clothes were gone. Since Kolnick was free at the time, he could have done this one, whose owner was still unknown but not the next one, which was found on October 20th. She had been killed about three days before Kolnick was taken into custody. He didn't kill her for sure, but her injuries were the same as those of the other victims, Whoever killed her was getting more brazen and more frantic as he cut her apart. This person was completely gutted, and the organs that were taken were nowhere to be found. But her eyes stayed the same. Even though she rode the train, she might not be in the series. Maybe the killer changed his plan or was stopped in the middle of it. A set of bones were found in the woods about four weeks later, not too far from where the body was found. Her eyes had been gouged out, so it was thought that she had died sometime in the summer. After the year changed to 1984, it wasn't long before the 10th unsolved murder turned up. This was a boy who was found near the train tracks. He was found to be 14-year-old Sergei Markov, who had not been seen since December 27. Because winter makes things last longer, Mikhail Fatisov and the other detectives were finally able to see what the killer did to these young people. He had stabbed the boy dozens of times in the neck. What would be the final tally? He cut into the boy's genitalia and took everything out of the boy's pubic area. He had also sexually assaulted the woman. Then it looked like he had gone to a nearby place to go to the bathroom. It was clear that Kolnick, who was in jail, was not to blame, and that the crazy person who was committing these crimes was still out there. The police made a mistake in their haste to close these cases. Fatisov decided to retrace the steps the boy took on the day he went missing. The boy got on the Elektrichka, or local train, in the town of Gukovo, where he lived and where he was going that day. Teachers at a home for people with mental retardation in the same town said that Mikhail Tyapin, who was 23 at the time, had left around the same time as the boy and had taken the train. He was a very big young man who could barely speak. Once again, someone told the police what they knew. Then Tyapin and his friend Alexander Ponomaryev said they had met Markov, led him into the woods, and killed him. They also left behind their poop. In particular, Tyapin had a lot of violent fantasies, and he claimed to be responsible for several other unsolved murders in the area. But he never said anything about how it hurt the eyes, and he and Panamaria both admitted to two murders that had been committed by other people. The police were now very confused, and both Fatisov and Barakov had their doubts that they had caught the killer they were looking for. All of the confessions were not true. He thought that there was only one person involved, that this person was a lone wolf and not part of a group, and that he was clearly crazy in a way that was not too obvious. Then they got their first good piece of proof. The doctor who did Markov's autopsy found sperm in his anus. He was raped, and the person who did it ejaculated on him. When they caught the killer, they could compare the blood antigens to see if they were the same. This wouldn't be a perfect match, but it could help rule out some suspects. In fact, it got rid of every young man who had confessed up to that point. All of their blood was the wrong kind. A lab then put out a second report saying that it had mixed up the sample. The description did match Mikhail Tyapin. That meant that there was a good chance they knew who killed Markov. Still, bodies kept turning up. In 1984, the bodies of many people were found in wooded areas, some of them close to where other bodies had been found and taken away. After Ty Papin was caught, the first body found was a woman who had been cut up in the same way as the others. 
but her eyes were still there, and one thing had changed, a finger was gone. They also had a size 13 shoe print in the mud as another piece of evidence. There were traces of blood and sperm on the victim's clothes. She was soon found to be an 18-year-old girl who had been seen with a boy who worked nearby at the bus station. When asked, he had an explanation. The medical examiner's report said three important things. She had pubic lice, she had food in her stomach that she hadn't digested, and she didn't have any sperm inside her. It looked like the killer had masturbated over her. Given that she was poor, it was also possible that she had been lured away with the promise of a meal. The police looked in pharmacies to see if anyone was buying treatments for lice, but they didn't find anyone. They did find out that this woman had a friend who hadn't been seen since 1982. They were able to identify the second victim in the series by comparing dental records to skulls from different remains. That was the connection between two of the victims, one of whom had her eye sockets cut and the other of whom did not. Another suspect was caught, and he admitted to being the killer, but Barakov was looking for a certain kind of person, and so far, no one seemed to fit the bill. He told officials what he thought, and they told him to shut up. His opinion also split the task force into different groups, which was made worse by the fact that the crime lab couldn't tell them for sure if the sperm samples found on two different victims were from the same person. They got a forensic scientist from a lab in Moscow, who did a better job. She told them they were type ab. With that, she took them off the list of possible suspects. So far, none of the confessions were useful, and the killer was still out there. In March, he went to Nova Shokhtinsk and grabbed 10-year-old Dmitry Toshnikov. Three days later, he was found cut up and stabbed. He was missing the tip of his tongue and his penis. Semen was found on his shirt, which linked him to the two other crimes where semen was found. There was a big footprint near the body. This time though, there were people there to see it. People saw the boy following a tall man with hollow cheeks, stiff knees, big feet, and glasses. Still, no one had seen him. A white car had been seen by someone else. Then, a 17-year-old girl named Ludmila Alexieva was found with 39 cuts on her body made with a kitchen knife. There were no leads so time and money were wasted. Soon, there was a second victim, and soon after that, a third. One was a girl killed with a hammer, the other was a woman stabbed many times with a knife. Both the mother and the daughter died at the same time. By the end of that summer in 1984, 24 people had probably been killed by the same person. Every bit of sperm that was left behind had the same ab antigen. One of the victims had a single gray hair that seemed to belong to a man, and there were pieces of clothing near the boy that didn't match his clothes. Larry says that the killer's pattern had changed a little bit that year, he cut off the upper lip and sometimes the nose and left them in the mouth or stomach of the victim. Since there were no witnesses, not much physical evidence, and no way for the police to figure out how this man was getting his victims to leave alone, they thought the investigation was out of hand. They thought that this killer went from killing five people in the first year to killing one every two weeks. He was bound to make a mistake at some point. They didn't know yet if they hadn't found the earliest murders and that the killing spree would continue for a while. This man didn't mess up very often. With all the surveillance, it was inevitable that some suspicious men would be followed and held. This led to two suspects, each of whom was interesting for different reasons. One appeared to be the man they were after, and the other became an informant. The Minister of the Interior appointed a dozen new detectives to the case, and a task force of some 200 men and women became involved in the investigation. Barakov was chosen to be the leader of this group. That helped him find leads as they came in. They also put heavy duty on him to come up with a good plan to stop this killer. People were sent to work undercover in parks and at bus and train stations. Cullen says that they decided to look for a tall, well-built man between the ages of 25 and 30 with type ab blood. He was careful, at least averagely smart, and probably had a good way with words. He went places and lived with his mother or with a wife. He might have been in a mental hospital or used drugs in the past. He might also know something about anatomy and be good with a knife. Anyone who had most of these things in common would have to take a blood test. The press was only allowed to ask for witnesses about one or more of the murders, not about how they were all connected. No warnings were given to parents to keep their kids safe or to young women who were out by themselves. At the bus station in Rostov, a covert officer saw an older man. He talked to a young woman, and when she got on her bus, he went back and sat down next to another young woman. Major Zanyasovsky thought it was time to question him because he was acting strangely. The man's name was Andrei Chikatilo, and he ran a business that sold machinery. He was there for work, but his home was in Shakta. 
He told a young woman he was talking to that he used to be a teacher and missed talking to young people. He was let go by the officer. But he saw Chikatilo again, so he went after him and got on the same bus, he was on to watch him. He seemed very ill at ease, Zanyasovsky's report states, and was always twisting his head from one side to another. He followed Chikatilo into another bus and saw him accost various women. When Chikatilo asked for a prostitute and had oral sex under his coat, he was arrested for being rude in public and his briefcase was looked through. There was a jar of Vaseline, a long kitchen knife, a piece of rope, and a dirty towel inside, but nothing that made me think it was for business. Zanyasovsky thought he knew who killed Lesa Belosa. He asked the prosecutor to come to the man's house and question him. Chikatilo's blood was taken, and it turned out to be type A, not AB. He was also a member of the Communist Party, and people who knew him well said he was a good person. There was nothing in his past that made us wonder about him. Nevertheless, they kept him in jail for a couple of days to see if sitting in a cell might pressure him into a confession. He denied everything, but he did say that he had sexual weakness. In the end, he was let go. He was arrested again for small thefts at work, and he went to prison for three months. Still, he didn't have the right type of blood, so he couldn't have killed them. Barakov decided to go against the rules and talk to psychiatrists in Moscow. He wanted to know what they thought about the idea of a single person killing both women and children of both genders. Most people were either not interested or wouldn't say much because there wasn't enough information. But one psychiatrist, Alexander Bukhanovsky, agreed to put together a profile based on the few facts that were known and the patterns at the crime scene. He read everything he could get his hands on, specialized in sexual pathologies and schizophrenia, and was willing to take risks. Even though this case was strange, it interested him. He came up with a seven-page report. The killer, he said, was a sexual deviant between 25 and 50 years old and about 5 feet 10 inches tall. He thought the man had some kind of sexual inadequacy, so he blinded his victims so they couldn't look at him. He also beat up their bodies, partly out of frustration and partly to make himself feel more aroused. He was a sadist who had trouble getting relief without being cruel. Many sadists liked to inflict superficial wounds, which were. Barakov got two other opinions, and one of them said there were two killers. He was still frustrated because no one had given him anything that helped him close the case. With the idea that the killer had a sexual problem, the determined investigator looked up records of men who had been convicted of homosexual crimes. He found Valery Ivanenka who had committed several acts of perversion and said he was crazy. Ivanenka was tall and wore glasses. He was 46 years old and had been a teacher. He had been sent to a mental hospital in Rostov, but had gotten away. Barakov watched the apartment of the man's sick mother and caught and arrested him. But his blood was type A, which ruled him out as the killer. In exchange for his freedom, Barakov made a deal with him to help him investigate the gay population. Ivanenka was very good at getting secret information, which led to other people giving more information when they were put under pressure. Soon, Barakov knew a lot about Rostov's underworld from perversion to violence. Still, Barakov felt like he was going in circles because the gay men he was looking into didn't seem to have the right personality disorder for these crimes. He started to agree with Bukhanovsky's theory that the killer was heterosexual but probably unable to have normal sexual relations. He needed more information. Pressure was on to solve the crimes that had already happened, but over the next 10 months, only one more body was found, a young woman who had been killed near Moscow. The killer may have moved or traveled there, but they couldn't be sure. They wondered if the killer had left the area, been arrested, or died. Then in August 1985, a body was found near an airport. She looked like the others and had been killed in the same way. Barakov went to Moscow to look at the photos of the dead girl. It was so similar to his recent victim in Rostov that he knew the killer had gone to Moscow for some reason. He checked the flight rosters between Moscow and the airport where their victim had been found, and had the officers go painstakingly through all the handwritten tickets. But they failed to discover a significant clue right under their noses. Then detectives in Moscow put together a series of murders of young boys that had begun when the Rostov killings had stopped. All three had been raped, and one was decapitated. But the Rostov crew was quickly drawn back to Shakta, in a tree grove near the bus depot, an 18-year-old girl lay dead with her mouth full of leaves. This was the same signature as the girl in Moscow earlier that month. She had red and blue thread under her fingernails and ab blood near her wounds, which was different from her own type O blood. 
In fact, they did find a good suspect who was also linked to a previous victim. After 10 days of intense questioning, the suspect confessed, but Barakov didn't think it sounded right. The suspect also couldn't lead them to the right murder site, so he was not their man. A special procurator with one serial killer investigation behind him, Chief Investigator Isa Kostoyev, was appointed to look into the Lesopolosa murders. By this time they had 15 procurators and 29 detectives involved. Many of them were watching train and bus stations for suspicious activity. The female officials worked undercover to try to lure men to talk to them. Kostoyev looked over the work done thus far and felt it had not proceeded well. In fact, he believed they'd already come across the man they were after, and just hadn't known it. This did nothing to improve the already low morale of the investigating team. To try to learn more about the type of killer who would be so raw and brutal Kostoyev had the classic 19th century work on sexual predators by Richard von Croft Ebbing translated into Russian. He also discovered a rare edition of Crimes and Criminals in Western Culture, by B. Utevsky, which included a chapter detailing cases of dismemberment and disfiguring of victims. He saw that some killers were driven merely by arrogance and the idea that their victims were objects that belonged to them to do with as they pleased. Kostoyev stored this information away to use when they found more suspects. In the meantime, Yuri Kulnik was still in prison awaiting the completion of the investigation into him, which was now delayed by investigators looking into other areas. One of these leads produced yet a fifth false confession. Something was clearly wrong with the process, and Kostoyev was furious. He did not believe that Yuri was guilty of anything. Barakov turned again to drive, Bukhanovsky, finally allowing him to see all of the crime scene reports so he could write a more detailed profile. This, he thought, might help them narrow the leads. Bukhanovsky took all of the materials and spent months of his own time writing 65 pages devoted to what made sense to him from his work with gay men, sexual dysfunction, necrophiles, and necrosadists. He labeled the unknown suspect Killer X. The details, in brief, were the following X was not psychotic because he was in control of what he did and he was clearly self-interested. He was narcissistic and arrogant, considering himself gifted, although he was not unduly intelligent. He had a plan, but he was not creative. He was heterosexual, with the boy being a vicarious surrogate. He was a necrosadist, needing to watch people die in order to achieve sexual gratification. He would hit them in the head to make them helpless, and then he would stab them multiple times to enter them sexually. He either sat on them or squatted next to them, getting as close as he could. The deepest cuts gave him the most pleasure, and he might masturbate, either on his own or with his hand. There were many reasons why he might have cut out the eyes, and nothing in the crime scene suggested what actually motivated X. He might be excited by their eyes or fear them. He might believe his image was left on them, a superstition held by some. Cutting into the sexual organs was a manifestation of power over women. He might keep the missing organs or he might eat them. Removing the sexual organs from the boys might be a way to neutralize them and make them appear more female. An interesting twist was the hypothesis that X responded to changes in weather patterns. Before most of the murders, the barometer had dropped. That might have been his trigger, especially if it coincided with other stressors at home or work. Most of the killings were also done midweek, from Tuesday to Thursday. While he was vague about height and occupation, he now thought X's age was between 45 and 50 the age at which sexual perversions are often most developed. It was likely that he'd had a difficult childhood. He was conflicted and probably kept to himself. He had a rich fantasy life but an abnormal response to sexuality. Bukhanovsky could not say whether or not the man was married or had fathered children, but if he was married, his wife let him keep his own hours and did not ask much of him. His killing was compulsive and might stop temporarily if he sensed he was in danger of discovery, but would not stop altogether until he died or was caught. Despite the length and detail of this psychological report, Baraka found nothing practical in it to help him find the man. Then he consulted with someone who was much closer to these types of crimes, Anatoly Slivko, a man convicted of the sexual murder of seven boys, who faced execution. The police wanted this man to explain to them the workings of the mind of a serial killer. Slivko attributed his actions to his inability to engage in normal sexual arousal and satisfaction. Sexual murderers have endless fantasies through which they set up the rules of behavior and feel a demand for action, and the act of planning their crimes has its own satisfaction. He offered nothing practical for the investigation in what he said, but his manner under questioning showed them a compartmentalized mind that could kill boys and still feel morally indignant about using alcohol in front of children. That meant he could live in a way that hid his true propensities. 
only hours after the interview, Slivko was executed. Investigators thought that X was a lot like Slivko, which meant that he would be hard to catch. But then, oddly, the killing seemed to stop. Only one dead woman turned up in 1985 in Rostov, and nothing happened that winter or the next spring. Then, on July 23, the body of a 33-year-old female was turned up, but it bore none of the markings of the serial killer, except that she had been repeatedly stabbed. Barakov had doubts about her being in the series, but not so with a young woman found on August 18. All of the disturbing wounds were present, but she had been mostly buried, save for a hand sticking out of the dirt, a new twist. Now they had to wonder whether there were others not yet found who were also under the earth. The handwriting experts finally gave up on the black cat postcard, and the police could go no farther with the 14 suspects on the list so far, all of whom Barakov believed could be eliminated. He created a comprehensive booklet to give out to other police departments, and a card file was created to keep track of new leads. He and his team were dogged by the fear that this case might never be solved. At the end of 1986, Victor Baraka finally had a nervous breakdown. He was weak and exhausted and could not sleep. So he went to a hospital, where he remained for a month. Then he was sent to rest for another month. Four years of intense work had come to this. But he would not give up. He had no idea then that he was only halfway there. This devil was not yet finished. Barakov's period of rest, however, had given him some perspective. He'd been able to think over their strategies thus far and felt that none was taking them down the correct route. Not only that, all were time and resource consuming. He might only catch this killer if he surfaced again, in other words, murdered someone. It was a grim thought, but it could be their only hope. Yet nothing occurred for the rest of that year or throughout all of 1987. The winter melted into spring before a railroad worker found a woman's nude body in a weedy area near the tracks on April 6, 1988. Her hands were bound behind her, she had been stabbed multiple times, the tip of her nose was gone, and her skull had been bashed in. Only a large footprint was found nearby. People recalled seeing her, but she had been alone. There was no sign of sexual assault and her eyes had not been touched. Nor had she been killed in the woods. Investigators wondered if they should include this murder in the series. Maybe the Lesopolosa killer was no longer active. However, on May 17, the body of a nine-year-old boy was found in the woods near a train station. He'd been sodomized, and then his orifices were stuffed with dirt. He also had many knife wounds, a blow to the head, and his penis was missing. The boy was quickly identified as Alexei Boronko, who had been missing for two days. A classmate had seen him with a middle-aged man with gold teeth, a mustache, and a sports bag. They went into the woods together, and Alexei said he would be back soon, but he never did. This was a strong lead, one that could be followed up by area dentists. Few adults in the region could afford gold crowns for their teeth. Yet by the end of that year, they had turned up nothing. Not only that, they learned from the Ministry of Health that it had been a mistake to assume that typing blood in secretions was an accurate match to blood types, or, alternatively, to assume that the labs were providing accurate results. There were rare paradoxical cases in which they did not match. In other words, any of the suspects eliminated based on blood type could have been their killer. While this was frustrating news and made the investigation more difficult in many ways, it also opened a few doors from the past. However, it meant taking semen samples, which had to be voluntary, not blood types, and it also meant redoing four years' worth of work to that point. The idea was overwhelming. The only method of investigation that seemed viable now was to post more men to watch the public transportation stations. Still, the killer did not strike. It was April 1989 before they came across another victim who could be added to the Lesopolosa series. This discovery, in the woods near a train station, was that of a 16-year-old boy reported missing since the summer before. His killer had stabbed him repeatedly and had removed his testicles and penis. He was badly decomposed and had lain under the snow for months. A watch, inscribed by his aunt and uncle, was missing. It would help immensely if it was found in someone's possession. None of the investigators assigned to ride the trains and watch people in the stations in that area had reported anything suspicious. No older men with boys or women. However, a ticket clerk reported that she had seen a man that summer on the platform. He had tried to convince his son to go into the woods with him. The police did locate him, but quickly eliminated him as the killer they were seeking. But Yuri Kulnik had just been released from prison after five years, and he lived near where the body was found. 
Maybe they were too quick to let him go, but when they asked him about it, he said he didn't know anything, so they let him go. Then, on May 11th, an eight-year-old boy went missing. Two months later, he was found by the side of a road, stabbed and with his private parts cut up. This change in the killer's behavior, from killing in the woods to killing in the open, made the police think that he might have seen all the surveillance at the train stations and changed the way he killed people. That was disturbing. Yet killing someone so close to a road was also careless. That could be a hopeful sign. Even the most organized killer can disintegrate as need replaces caution. Then he killed a Hungarian student Elena Varga, in August, in a wooded area that was far from any train or bus station. Her body had been violated like all the other female victims in the Lesopolosa series, in just over a week. The fourth victim, a 10-year-old boy, Alexei Kobotov, went missing, and four months later, early in 1990, the sexually mutilated body of an 11-year-old boy turned up in Alessopolosa. Then another 10-year-old boy was killed, his sexual organs cut off and his tongue missing. It appeared to have been bitten off. Once more, the killer shifted his pattern and went for a female victim, and at the end of July in 1990 workmen found a 13-year-old boy, Viktor Petrov, killed and mutilated in the botanical gardens. The investigators now had what they believed were 32 victims over the past eight years, and the newspapers, now free to report this news after the loosening of government control, were putting pressure on the investigators. Those in the top positions threatened those on the lower rungs with being fired. This killer had to be stopped. People were getting desperate. Then, on August 17, Ivan Femin, 11, went swimming not far from his grandmother's cottage. He was found in the tall reeds not far from numerous potential witnesses who should have heard if not seen him. The serial killer had stabbed him 42 times and castrated him. This was outrageous, and the public was getting angry. Barakov decided on a new plan. He would select the most likely stations and then make surveillance obvious in the others, so that only those with plainclothes officers would seem safe to the killer. In other words, they would try to force him into action in a particular place, and in those places, they would record the names of every man who came and went. They would also place people in the forest nearby, dressed as farmers. It was a major task, with over 350 people who had to be in place and do their jobs for who knows how long, but it seemed viable. Two of the bodies were found near the train station in Dunlajos, so it seemed like it might be a good place to set up a post. During the summer, it was mostly used by mushroom pickers, but two other stations were also chosen. But before the plan was carried out, the killer chose a victim from the Dunlajos station. He killed a 16-year-old retarded boy by stabbing him 27 times and cutting him up before throwing away his clothes. Part of the boy's tongue and one of his testicles were missing, and he had been stabbed in the eye. When his identity was found out, police learned that he spent most of his time on the Electrica, a slow-moving train, but no. Burokov was in despair. They had a good plan and had it been in place, they might have caught the guy. Then another 16-year-old boy, Viktor Tashenko, was reported missing, he had gone to the Shakhtar railroad station to pick up tickets. Colin writes that the handsome, athletic Tishkenko was larger than any other male victim thus far, weighing around 130 pounds. They found his body two miles south, in the woods, and in the usual condition. It was where the mother and daughter had been found six years earlier. In the grove, there was evidence of a prolonged struggle. Barakov got moving. The snare was set, with everyone in place, but the killer was killed again, undetected. This time his victim was a young woman. She was number 36, and she had been beaten, sliced open, and part of her tongue cut off, but no one had seen a thing. Yet there were reports of men who had been at the train station nearby. One name stood out. In fact, they were chilled by it. They had seen this one before. At that point, according to Moira Martingale in Cannibal Killers, over half a million people had been investigated, but this one had been interrogated before and was only released because his blood type had not matched the semen samples. And they knew the lab work had been faulty. This was the killer. They were sure of it. Andrei Romanovich Chikatilo, 54, had been at the Dlohos train station on November 6. He had been questioned and cleared in 1984. He had now been placed at the scene of a victim's disappearance. He was seen coming out of the woods and had washed his hands at a pump. He also had a red smear on his cheek air cut finger and twigs on the back of his coat. The officer at the station had taken down his name. Barakov had the man placed under surveillance. They soon learned that he had resigned from his post as a teacher due to reports that he had molested students. He had then worked for another enterprise, 
but was fired when he failed to return from business trips with the supplies he was sent to get. So what had he been doing with his time? During the time he had spent in jail in 1984, there had been no murders, and his travel records coincided with other murders, including the one in Moscow. He had once been a member in good standing with the Communist Party, but had been expelled due to his incarceration. But all of the evidence was indirect. Investigators would have to catch him in the act or get him to confess. As they watched him, they saw a normal man doing nothing out of the ordinary. It was frustrating. Kostoyev, who had finally read the earlier report on this man, ordered his arrest. On November 20, 1990, three officers in street clothes brought Chikatilo in for questioning. They saw that he didn't have a mouth full of gold teeth, as one witness had said. They also learned that he was married, had two children, and had a university degree. They found a folding pocket knife in his satchel. They placed Chikatilo in a cell with a gifted informant, who was expected to get him to admit to what he had done, but failed. A search of Chikatilo's home, which shamed his family, produced no evidence of victims, but did yield 23 knives. Two writers have claimed these weapons were used for the murders, but that has not been proven. The next day, Kostoyev decided to handle the interrogation, and he did so in the presence of Chikatilo's court-appointed lawyer. Richard Lowry based much of his book, Hunting the Devil, on the time that Kostoyev spent with Chikatilo. Contrary to other versions of this narrative that show him to be an angry and impatient interrogator, Lowry says that Kostoyev had decided to use compassion to get the suspect to talk. He wanted the room to be spare, with only a safe inside that would hint to the prisoner of evidence against him. There was also a desk, a table, and two chairs. When Chikatilo was brought in, Kostoyev could see that he was a tall, older man with a long neck, sloping shoulders, oversized glasses, and gray hair. He used a shuffling gait, like a weary elderly person, but Kostoyev was not fooled. He believed Chikatilo was a calculating killer with plenty of energy when he needed it. Chikatilo looked easy to break, and Kostoyev had only failed to obtain a confession in three out of hundreds of interrogations. He would get inside the suspect's head, figure out his logic, and get him to talk. All the guilty men eventually confessed. They had to. Besides, he had ten days in which to succeed, and he had bait. Chikatilo began with a statement that the police had made a mistake, just as they had in 1984, when he'd first been investigated. He denied that he had been in the train station on November 6th and did not know why it had been reported. Kostoev knew he was lying, and he let Chikatilo know that. The next day Chikatilo waived his right to legal counsel. Then Chikatilo wrote a three-page document in which he confessed to sexual weakness the words he had used before, and to years of humiliation. He hinted at perverse sexual activity but did not name it, and said that he was out of control. He admitted to nothing specific. But he wrote another, longer essay in which he said that he did move around in the train stations and saw how young people there were the victims of homeless beggars. He also admitted that he was impotent. It appeared to be an indirect confession, feeling guilt but fending it off by fingering other suspects and also hinting at how it was best that some of these beggars had died rather than reproduce. Nevertheless, he mentioned that he had thought of suicide. Kostoev told him that his only hope would be to confess everything in a way that would show he had mental problems, so that an examination could affirm that he was legally insane, and he could be treated. Otherwise, the evidence they had would surely convict him without a confession, and he would have no hope of saving himself. That was Kostoev's bait, and he felt sure it would be effective. Chikatilo asked for a few days to collect himself and said he would then submit to an interrogation. Everyone expected that he would confess, but when the day arrived, he insisted he was guilty of no crimes. For each crucial time period involving a murder, he claimed that he had been at home with his wife. Clearly, he had used the extra two days alone in his cell to become more resolved. The next day, he changed some of what he had said. He had been involved in some criminal activity, but not murders. In 1977, he fondled some female students who had turned him on. He had trouble keeping himself in check around children, but only twice had he lost control. He wrote again but again he didn't say anything new. Nine days went by and Kostoev was no closer to his goal. He didn't know what to do to get this man to finally talk. A medical exam showed that Chikatilo's blood type was A, but his sperm was said to have a weak B antibody that made it look like his blood type was AB, even though it wasn't. If this analysis could be trusted, then he was the paradoxical rare case. The informant in Chikatilo's cell, writes Cullen, eventually told Barakov that the interrogation techniques were not according to protocol and that they were rough and made Chikatilo defensive. 
it was unlikely they were going to work. Kostoev brought in photographers to humiliate Chikatilo and pressure him to believe that they had witnesses to whom they were going to show these photographs. Still, he did not give any ground. Nine days had elapsed. They were allowed only ten before having to charge him with a specific crime, and thus far, they did not have enough proof of even one. It was looking very much like they might have to let him go. And that could be disastrous. Barakov, says Cullen, thought they should try another interrogator, and his candidate was Dr. Bukhanovsky. Cullen also says that Kostoyev initially resisted this idea, but finally had to admit he was getting nowhere. He agreed to let the psychiatrist see what he could do. Lowry, presenting things from Kostoyev's side, says that using the psychiatrist was one of Kostoyev's clever ploys. Lowry does not mention Barakov's role in the decision. Whoever thought of it, this was clearly a wise move. Bukhanovsky agreed to question Chikatilo, but out of professional interest, not for the court. Barakov agreed to these conditions. Bukhanovsky was soon in a closed room alone with the prime suspect in the Lesopolosa murders. The psychiatrist knew right away that this was the kind of man he had written about in his 1987 profile. So many of the signs were there, ordinary, alone, and not threatening. He introduced himself with a show of humility and then showed Chikatilo the profile. He felt that this man wanted to talk about his anger and shame, so it was best to show sympathy and listen. He did this for two hours before talking about the crimes. In the movie Citizen X, Bukhanovsky is shown asking Chikatilo to help him with some parts of the profile that he wasn't sure about. He reads the relevant pages to him, and Chikatilo listens intently, as if listening to the only person who seems to have ever understood him. As Bukhanovsky describes Chikatilo's mental illness and some of the reasons for it, Chikatilo begins to tremble. Bukhanovsky talked with him for hours and then went out and told police interrogators that the suspect was now ready to confess. Kostoya prepared a formal statement accusing Chikatilo of 36 murders. He was off by a long shot, but no one yet knew that. Chikatilo read the statement of charges and admitted that he was guilty of the crimes listed. He wanted now to tell the truth about his life and what had led him to these crimes. Among his admissions was his first murder, which had occurred not when the police had first begun to keep track of Lubov Buryuk but years earlier in 1978. He had killed a little girl, Yelena Zakotnova, age 9. This was alarming, since a man had already been arrested, tried, and executed for that murder. But Chikatilo said that he had moved to Shakta that year to teach. Before his family arrived, his free time was spent watching children and feeling a strong desire to see them without their clothes on. To maintain his privacy, he purchased a hut on a dark, dirty street. When he went to it one day, he came upon the girl, was seized with urgent sexual desire, and took her to the hut to attack her. When he could not achieve an erection, he moved in imitation of the sexual act and used his knife as a substitute. During his frenzy of strangulation and stabbing, he blindfolded her. Once she was dead, he tossed her body into a nearby river. Chikatilo was free. Lowry devotes a chapter to the fact that he was a suspect, seen by a witness, and that blood was found on his doorstep, but the other man had confessed under torture, so Chikatilo was free. Chikatilo was shocked to have nearly been caught. Kostoyev asked him why he was blindfolded, and just as they had thought, Chikatilo said that he had heard that a killer's image stays in a victim's eyes. It was a myth, but he had believed it, which is why he had hurt so many people in the eyes. Then he realized it wasn't true, so he stopped doing that which explains the change in pattern. Later, he said that he just did. Lowry says that Chikatilo hated how homeless people at train stations would go into the woods to have sexual encounters that he could never have. His fantasies became more violent. In 1981, he attacked a homeless girl looking for money in the same way, but this time he used his teeth to bite off a nipple and swallow it. At the moment of cutting her and seeing the body cut open, he said, I involuntarily ejaculated. He wrapped her in her. He remembered the details of each of the 36 Lesopolosa murders and went through them, one by one. Sometimes he acted as a predator, learning someone's routes and habits and finding a way to get that person alone. Others were victims of opportunity who happened along at the wrong time. The stabbing almost always served as a substitute for sexual intercourse that could not be performed. He had learned how to squat beside them in such a way as to avoid getting their blood on his clothing, which he demonstrated with a mannequin. At any rate, he worked for a shipping firm, so there was always an excuse for a scrape or cut. It seemed that his impotence generally triggered rage, especially if the women made demands or ridiculed him. 
He soon understood that he could not get aroused without violence. I had to see blood and wound the victims. Chikatilo thought the boys were his captives and that he was a hero for torturing and killing them. He couldn't explain why he cut off their tongues and penises, but at one point he said he was taking revenge on life through the genitals of his victims. But the whole thing, Chikatilo said, the cries, the blood, the agony gave me relaxation and a certain pleasure. He liked the taste of their blood and would even tear at their mouths with his teeth. He said it gave him animal satisfaction to chew or swallow nipples or testicles. To corroborate what he was saying, he drew sketches of the crime scenes and what he said fit the known facts. Then he confirmed what everyone had feared, he added more victims to the list. Many more. One boy he had killed in a cemetery and placed in a shallow grave, a hole, he said, that he had dug for himself when he had contemplated suicide. He took the interrogators there, and they recovered the body. Another was killed in a field, and she was located. On and on it went, murders here and there, and the bodies were always left right where they were killed, except for one. Chikatilo described a murder in an empty apartment, and to get the body out, he had to dismember it and dump the parts down a sewer. The police had wondered whether this one was part of the series and had decided that there were too many dissimilarities to include it. In the end, he confessed to 56 murders, Lowry counts it as 55, although there was corroboration for only 53, 31 females and 22 males. Barakov, says Cullen, believed that there might actually be more. They now had sufficient evidence to take this man to court. In the meantime, they discovered more about him. He was born in 1936 in a small Ukrainian village, and his head was misshapen from water on the brain. He had a sister seven years younger. His father was a POW in World War II and then was sent to a prison camp in Russia, so his mother raised him mostly on her own. In the HBO documentary Cannibal and in Moira Martingale's book Cannibal Killers, some of Chikatilo's background is described in a chilling context as a way to try to understand what drove him into such a bestial frenzy. In fact, Martingale sees a direct connection between those times and Chikatilo's sexual fantasies. He was like a werewolf, changing into a ravaging animal when triggered in just the right way. Much of this information came from the confession, the assessments made later, and from investigative research. During the early part of the 20th century, there were many famines in the former Soviet Union, especially in Ukraine. This was because Stalin crushed private agriculture and sent many people to the Siberian Gulag. According to Cullen, six million people died of starvation, and desperate people would take meat from dead bodies to eat. Sometimes they went to a cemetery where bodies were stacked, and sometimes, legend has it, they just grabbed someone on the street. Chikatilo grew up during several of these famines. His mother told him that his older brother, Stepan, had been killed. In a prison interview, he said, many people went crazy, attacked people and ate people. So they caught my brother, who was 10 and ate him. He might simply have died and been consumed, if he even existed, which could not be corroborated in any records, but Chikatilo's mother would warn him to stay in the yard or he might get eaten as well. It was a scary idea, but titillating. He also saw the results of the Nazi occupation and of German bombing, with bodies blown up in the streets. He said that they frightened and excited him. Most of his childhood was spent alone, living in his fantasies. Other children mocked him for his awkwardness and sensitivity. He began to develop anger at this age, even rage. To entertain and empower himself, he devised images of torture, and these remained a fixed part of his killings later in life. He had his first sexual experience as an adolescent when he struggled with a 10-year-old friend of his sister's and ejaculated. That impressed itself on him especially as he went along in life unable to get an erection but able to ejaculate. The struggle became as fixed in his mind as the images of torture. He went into the army, but when he came home and tried to have a girlfriend, he found he was still unable to perform the sexual act. The girl spread this around, humiliating him, and he dreamed about catching her and tearing her to pieces. His life as far as he could see, was now a disaster. He became a school teacher and did get married, which was arranged by his sister, but could only conceive children, according to the HBO documentary, by ejaculating outside his wife and pushing his semen inside by hand. Much like his mother, his wife was critical, which only made Chikatilo withdraw even further into his fantasy world. His mother died in 1973 when he was 37, and it wasn't long before he found himself attracted to young girls and began to molest them. When incidents were reported, they were met with cover-up and denial instead of prosecution, allowing a pervert to become a killer. Since he was on the road a lot as a part supply liaison, 
it was easy for him to find vulnerable strangers, dominate them, and kill them. He didn't have to go looking for them, he said. They were always there and they were usually willing to follow him. Chikatilo thought he had a disease that made him do things he couldn't control. He wanted to see experts on sexual deviance and said he would answer all of their questions. Larry says this was part of Kostoyev's plan. He was sent to Moscow Serbsky Institute for two months for psychiatric and neurological assessment, and it was determined that he had brain damage from birth. It had affected his ability to control his bladder and his seminal emissions. His mother criticized him for it repeatedly and was often cruel. He had deviant fantasies. However, after all the reports, he was found to be sane. He knew what he was doing and he could have controlled it. That was good enough for the prosecutor. They brought him into the Rostov courtroom on April 14, 1992, and put him into a large iron cage painted off-white, where he could either stand or sit. The judge sat on a dais, and two citizens on either side acted as jurors. There were 225 volumes of information collected about him and against him. The press wrote about the maniac and spread the word about his upcoming trial, so the courtroom, which seated 250, was filled with the families of many of his alleged victims. When he entered, they began to scream at him. Bald and without his glasses, he looked slightly crazy, especially when he drooled and rolled his eyes later in the trial. Throughout, Chikatilo appeared to be bored, except when he'd show a flash of anger and yell back at the crowd. On two separate occasions, he opened his trousers and pulled them down to expose his penis, insisting he was not a homosexual. They removed him from the courtroom. That he would be found guilty of murder was a foregone conclusion, but there was a chance that his psychological problems could save him from execution. However, his lawyer, Maraka Bibulin, did not have the right to call psychiatric experts, only to cross-examine those that the prosecution brought in, and since he had not been appointed until after Chikatilo had fully confessed, he was at a real disadvantage. Although the prosecutors were Anatoly Zadorozhny and N.F. Gerasimenko, Judge Leonid Akubzinov became Chikatilo's chief enemy, asking sharp questions of the witnesses and throwing demeaning comments at the prisoner, who often did not respond. After several months, however, Chikatilo challenged the judge, claiming that he was the one in charge. This is my funeral, the defendant said. At one point, he spontaneously denied doing six of the murders, and at another, he added four new ones. He claimed to be a victim of the former Soviet system and called himself a mad beast. According to Kravich and Olgin, he also claimed that there should be 70 incidents attributed to him, not 53. At one point, they write, when he was asked whether he had kept track as he killed his victims, Chikatilo said, I considered them to be enemy aircraft I had shot down. No one adequately addressed the fact that there was a discrepancy between the blood type in the semen samples and Chikatilo's blood type. The forensic analyst explained her discovery of the rare phenomenon of a man having one blood type but secreting another, but this hypothesis was later ridiculed around the world. Yet, with no forensic experts hired for the defense, there was little the defense attorney could do. The judge, with his clear bias against the defendant, accepted the unusual analysis. In August, the trial went on. The defense summed up its case by saying that the evidence and psychiatric analyzes were wrong and that the confessions were forced. He asked for a not guilty verdict. The next day, Chikatilo sang and talked nonsense from his cage, saying that he was being radiated. He was taken out of the room before the prosecutor started his final argument, in which he explained what sadism was, listed all of the crimes, and asked for the death penalty. Chikatilo was brought in and given a final opportunity to speak for himself. He remained mute. The judge took two months to reach a verdict, and on October 14, six months after the trial began, he pronounced Andre Chikatilo guilty of five counts of molestation and 52 counts of murder. Then Chikatilo cried out incoherently, shouting swindlers, spitting, throwing his bench, and demanding to see the corpses. The judge sentenced him to be executed. The people shouted for Chikatilo to be turned over to them to be torn to pieces as he had done to their loved ones. But instead, he was taken back to his cell to await the results of an appeal. His lawyer claimed through official channels that the psychiatric assessment had not been objective and he wanted further analysis. A rumor circulated that the Japanese wanted to pay $1 million for the maniac's brain, Lowry writes, but there was no substance to it. Yet many professionals did believe that his behavior was so aberrant that he should be studied while alive. This man, with a university degree in Russian literature, a wife and children, and no apparent background of child abuse, clearly had a savage heart. As he said of himself, 
he was apparently a mistake of nature. It's unfortunate that a better biopsychological analysis was never performed. On February 15, 1994, when his appeal was turned down, he was taken to a special soundproof room and shot behind the right ear, ending his life. Chikatilo has become one of the world's most renowned serial killers, cited in books and articles such as Dr. Louis Schlesinger's Serial Offenders, as a man with truly perverse tastes and killing habits. Thanks to him, Russian specialists can now engage in better study of serial killers and consult with professionals like the FBI in other countries. The same can be said for Bukhanovsky. Newsweek published a story in 1999 about the area around Rostovodon to the effect that it was now a hotbed of serial crimes. 29 multiple murderers and rapists have been caught in the area over the past 10 years, writes Owen Matthews. He claims that such a statistic makes Rostov the serial killer capital of the world. Not only that, but Dr. Bukhanovsky has become such an expert via his private clinic for sexual disorders that he claims he can now cure violent psychopaths. To prove it, he worked with an active killer still at large, a controversial decision. He feels that he cannot break a confidence, and that his study will help science determine the roots of aggression. A child rapist who was caught said that Bukhanovsky had a way of getting people to tell him things they would ordinarily keep secret. That appears to have been his talent with Chikatilo, 